editorial aside, let me continue. In other words, evolution is a hacker. Now, if you want to call it God, I don't require you to use the language which once was familiar to me in my context as a religious person, institutionally. I don't care what language you use. Just know that there is an overarching process underway, and evolution is a hacker, and if you want to call the source of intelligence behind it God, then you have to admit that the way God seems to work things out is like a hacker. In other words, making a lot of stuff up, recreating and recombining possible forms all the time, some of which seem to last like dinosaurs for millions of years before the Earth decides it can handle their exclusion in order to make way for the little lemurs that became us, the little mammals that needed the dinosaurs to get out of the way. That doesn't mean they got out of the way so we could advance. It means they got out of the way and we replaced them and took the niche. So that's a way of saying quite seriously that reverence for life does not mean bowing down before it. It means engaging with it the way God or evolution engages with the universe through trial and error, keeping what works, throwing away what doesn't, sowing lots and lots of seeds, what grows, nurture, and prune, what doesn't plow under. That's reality. So ethics is always opposed to self-interest. Why? Because ethics is about the other. Ethics isn't not only what doing for yourself is good, what is good for yourself, but what is good for the other. But like that Mobius strip suggested, the self and the other in this case, are the same. Because the other you are trying to design, enhance, or augment is the future self that will no longer be the self that is making the decisions here and now on the basis of imperfect knowledge. And that leads to, I'm going to give you two rules for ethics in the course of this talk. And the first one is, obviously, self-defeating, really stupid things are unethical. And as a wise man said, life is very hard, but it's a lot harder if you're stupid. So, the first rule, don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Now, this has, of course, some prior states of consciousness and awareness that are required. You have to know that you are stupid, and an awful lot of stupid people don't know they're stupid, and therefore they do stupid things. But that means ask somebody. Now, that requires a certain degree of humility and awareness to know that you don't know. There are unknown unknowns about what you want to do, as Rumsfeld said. And there are other people always around us who are wiser and smarter than us or more mature. So if we engage with them. In the religious world, we call it spiritual direction. We call it therapy. We call it a spiritual companion. But it means you can't always make these decisions alone. And if you know that you don't know, which is already an advanced condition of awareness, then you engage other people who are smarter than you. What am I describing? You should recognize the hacker meritocracy in this. I remember people staying up all night on the floor of Barnes & Noble uh, or uh, Borders, which some of you are too young to know used to be a bookstore. And they would stay up all night with all the O'Reilly books, going over all the details they could, learning, learning, learning. If they were true hackers, when they went online into a, a, a news group then or a list, you ask questions with humility and deference, showing respect for your elders. And if they got from your question that you had done all the homework you could do prior to coming to them, rather than writing a question that I still get sometimes by email, can you teach me how to hack, um, which gets you a slap and dismissal, uh, then you get the respect back and the information you need. You have to learn how to be part of a learning group. And that's more important than ever. So, boxer, for example, getting ready to decide when to attack does not apply rules about body angle or distance from the jaw and so forth. But when he sees the right picture in front of him, he hits. He uses the behavior that was successful in an earlier situation, triggered by the similarity of the new situation to the old. He responds intuitively to the patterns without breaking them down into their component features. So intuition comes to occur effortlessly due to discrimination resulting from prior experience. A real expert carries this capability in its highest form. An expert knows what to do based on a mature and practiced understanding. Experts are completely engrossed in what they are doing. They're in a condition that the 
famous writer at the University of Chicago called Flow. You lose self-consciousness and are one with the situation. You are in it. You are immersed fully conscious in it. So experts don't solve problems and do not make decisions. They do what works and they know what works. Experience produces an ability to discriminate among a huge number of situations. So the expert's responses become unconscious, automatic, natural, and fluid. A nurse may sometimes sense the patient lies in imminent danger of relapse and urge a doctor to act right away. They'll pick it up. They'll sense it, they say. Here's a quote, real quote, from an expert psychiatric nurse clinician. When I say to a doctor, this patient is psychotic, I don't always know how to legitimize the statement, but I am never wrong. Because I know psychosis inside and out. I feel it, I smell it, I know it, and I trust it. That's the way it comes to work. You're no longer doing check the boxes and answering questions and following rules. You just see it, and you know that you're right. So, if experts access rules, they're meta rules. They're the principles that transcend the stated or known principles. And because of that, we may not be able to articulate them, just like meta rules in privacy, except as abstractions. And the abstractions don't sound real to people who don't function on that level. They think you're making it up. They also think you're acting arbitrarily in different situations. But you're not. They think you're acting arbitrarily because they can't see the internal basis for what you have learned and know on the basis of which you are then making that decision. So it looks arbitrary and scares them to death, and that's why they respond in what you would call literalist or fundamentalist way. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Because that violates the rules at the level at which they operate. The goal of people in all of this conference proceeding is to arrive at a level of expertise in knowing what to do at an extreme level of self-transformation and know that they know it. But if you don't know it, and don't know that you know it, know that you don't know it. In other words, here's the second rule. If you don't know when to break the rule, don't break the rule. In other words, use the rules because you're novice or advanced beginner or even competent. But if you know why you are breaking the rule, that that rule no longer applies at the level of abstraction and insight you have now reached, then you break the rule with confidence, clarity, and a freedom of action. But if you don't, don't do it. There you are. This is how you engage with this. Like a hacker entering into engagement or conversation with a meritocracy that has rules for how you learn and how you show respect and how you do obeisance to those who are superior to you. You don't walk out of a talk and someone like, well, I'll use Robert Buchanan because we talked to him for an hour afterward and this guy really knows what he's talking about. You don't say, oh, he's just, be a, just an academic or he's just a doctor or he's part of the medical establishment. If you're doing that, it's just defensive and it's defensive on behalf of a primitive or immature ego. No, you pay attention to what the best people are saying and then, if you find they're wrong, you go beyond that. But you don't just reject wholesale, whole areas of understanding. Um, I think that someone who only goes to alternative medicine and says the medical establishment is a complete scam, uh, refuses treatment for serious diseases uh, to her detriment. Whichever one you make, everything, it's never everything. Some alternative approaches are good. But a lot are snake oil. And some medicine is self-interested and profit-driven and uh, exploitative. But a lot is really pretty sound. And it's not a simplistic thing to simply reject one or the other. So, life unfortunately or fortunately is fired at us point blank every morning when we wake up in the barrel of a gun. It confronts us with its urgency, with its immediacy. Real life doesn't lend itself to simplistic categories of good and evil. It's all gray. I don't know if you saw a movie some years ago called The Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood. 
Who was, was it Robert Duvall? The guy who was playing the bad guy, bad sheriff. And after a lot of stuff where you clear who's the good guy, Clint Eastwood, who's the bad guy, the sheriff, uh, Clint Eastwood has the bad guy on his back, and he's got a rifle in his hand, and it's pointed at the guy's face. And the sheriff says, don't do that. Don't. He says, I finally got my life together. I got a girl. We're living on the ranch. I'm going to retire from the sheriff. I don't deserve this. And Clint Eastwood said, deserves has nothing to do with it. And then he pulled the trigger. Well, that's life. Life tells us a lot. Deserves has nothing to do with it. And then it pulls the trigger. Knowing that, knowing what life can do and be, means we have an obligation to respond. This is the ethical part. This is the reverence part. This is the hacking part. By becoming as knowledgeable, as aware, as conscious as possible with humility, and engaging with it in a way that enables us to take the reins of our own freedom and power in our hands and self-transcend and self-transform as we can. Now, what does that look like to be an expert in ethics? Let me give you an image. Oh, that's Clint Eastwood. We already did him. That's Huckleberry Finn. Way back in the old days, when we had what we called a canon in literature, people read Mark Twain. And um, Mark Twain wrote a book called Huckleberry Finn. Huckleberry Finn was written after Tom Sawyer. It was, we'd call it a sequel today. It took a spin-off character and made a whole book about it because he was so popular. Huck Finn was a wild spirit, a free spirit, and it was based on Mark Twain's own experiences of himself as a boy. Well, why is that relevant? Because uh, Huck Finn took off down the Mississippi River on a raft with the runaway slave named Jim. And they became close in a way that uh, was proscribed or forbidden by society in the middle 19th century in Missouri, southern border state, uh, in those times. They became close. And that got to the point where they knew where Jim was, and they knew that Huck knew where he was, and they knew Huck could turn him in. And the, these are the two things that they told Huck about why he should turn him in. Number one, it's illegal for you not to tell us where he is. It's property. And... He's stolen or stolen himself, and you're harboring stolen property, and you're going to go to jail if you don't tell us where he is. In addition, this was a fire in a brimstone kind of Protestant area. There was hellfire preached from the, from the pulpit all the time in sermons all over Missouri. And so the moral framework of the religious world in which they all lived without variation said not only will you go to jail, but you're going to go to hell. And that was a hell based on fire and damnation and scary stuff for a young teen like a fit. He didn't have LSD to tell him what was real and not real. He couldn't make the distinctions. We're gifted with you know. So he was scared. So he's got two threats. You're going to go to jail and you're going to be damned eternally. And Huck took that corn cob pipe, which he's smoking, and sat under a tree all night cogitating upon those promises and possibilities. And when dawn came, he had his decision. He said, well, damn it, then I'll go to hell. Damn it, then I'll go to hell. That's what an expert in ethics looks like. All the rules of the day, both legal and moral and religious, told him to do this. And he transcended them in a leap of intuitive knowledge that the right thing to do was not turn in what was not property but a human being and accept the consequences, as people like Martin Luther King were willing to do, when you break a law in order to expose it hello, to the conscience, to the conscience of the neighborhood and the society in which you live. So that's track. Uh, uh, okay. The heck of the slide. They're just pictures. And I can tell you what they look like. 